I should like to call your attention this morning to the message of the 27th Psalm, which we read together at the beginning. A psalm, as you know, is a song, and therefore is something which should generally be taken as a whole and in its entirety, because generally in this one song, the psalmist has one great message to give us, and that is particularly true of this 27th Psalm. If you want any particular verse, Take the fourth verse. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Now, like most of these psalms, the psalmist here is giving us his experience. And his reason for doing that is that he is anxious to praise God. He is anxious also to help others. That's the whole purpose of giving an experience, not to call attention to oneself, but to call attention to the Lord, who is the giver of all experiences, and who alone is worthy to be praised. And as we look at the experience of this man, we can learn many lessons from him. What he does here, of course, is to teach us how to face the whole problem and battle of life and of living. That is the great value, of course, of the Psalms always. They're always so practical because they are experimental or experiential. They have this additional value that it isn't a man writing theoretically about life, but it's generally a man who, having passed through some experience which have tried him and tested him, had uh, again rediscovered the only way of success and of triumph and wants to celebrate that and wants to pass on the information uh, to others. And another great value, of course, in the Psalms is the fact that they're always so honest. The psalmist doesn't pretend that he's better than he is. He opens his heart. He exposes himself to us, as it were, exactly as he is. Tells us about his fears and his forebodings. Doesn't conceal any of his own weakness. And so we feel that he speaks to our condition. Now, uh, no one can decide for certain whether the psalmist wrote this psalm immediately after some great trying experience or whether he wrote it while he was actually facing some such trial. It is probably like the others, a psalm of David, and therefore we can assume that uh, as David was so constantly in trials and troubles and tribulations, this was some very recent experience uh, of which he tells us in this particular psalm. Now, I needn't take any time in showing you the value of all this to us. Because, after all, we are in a life which is involved in struggle. Nothing is so wrong and indeed dishonest as to pretend that the moment you become a Christian that all your problems are left behind and that you'll never have any difficulties anymore. That's just not true. The Christian is not promised an easy time in this world. Indeed, the reverse is much nearer the truth. We are told in many places in the New Testament that because we are Christians, we can expect unusual trials because we are followers of the Lord. Look at his life. He is the Son of God in this world. Yet he was tried, he was tempted, he was tested. He had to suffer the contradiction of sinners against himself. His life was one of battle and of conflict. And if that was true of him, as he himself pointed out, you'll find it in the 15th chapter of John's Gospel, how much more so is it likely to be true of his followers? Because we are Christians, the devil and all his forces will be particularly concerned to try us and to test us, to bring us down if not into sin, that enter it into a condition of defeat and of unhappiness, a sense of insecurity, and filled with a spirit of fear. Now, the New Testament, I say, as well as the Old Testament, uh, prepares us for all that. God's people have had great trials and tribulations and fights while they were in this world. We're not promised an easy time, but what we are promised is that in spite of it all, we can be more than conquerors. Now, that's the Christian position. 
It doesn't minimize the problems. It doesn't tell us there are going to be none. It faces them as they are. Indeed, I've often claimed, and do so again this morning, that the Bible is the most honest book in the world. It's the politicians who are always promising us that our troubles are going to be abolished. And the philosophers. And the poets. These are the dangerous optimists. These idealists. They're always going to make a perfect world. The Bible never says that. The Bible tells us the precise opposite. That while man is in rebellion against God and is a sinner, the world will be full of problems and difficulties. Yes, there will be wars and rumors of wars. The Bible has always said that. It's other people who don't believe the Bible who promise that by some human organization we'll banish war. No, no. The, the, the Bible is realistic and tells us, here it is, there are enemies, there are powers set against you. But, in spite of that, you can be more than conqueror through him that loved us. Very well. I start, therefore, by putting a question to you this morning. How are you standing up to life? How are you getting on in this battle? Are you triumphant? Are you assured? Are you more than conqueror? That's what we're meant to be as God's people. How are you facing the stresses and the trials, the troubles and the tribulations of life? Now, last Sunday morning, we were looking at the children of Israel facing their problem in the wrong way, by seeking a king to reign over them when God was their king. Well, thank God, we turn this morning to the right way of facing these problems and trials and tribulations. Now, here the psalmist tells us, out of his own experience, the only way whereby one can indeed truly be more than conqueror in a world like this. It is the only way. What is it? Well, let's look at this. Here is a psalm of some 14 verses. But it can be divided up very simply into three sections. Three stanzas, if you like. Three verses. The first section consists of the first six verses. Then the second section is from verse 7 to verse 12. And then you've got a final section, a conclusion, in the last two verses, verses 13 and 14. And this is the division. In the first section, verses 1 to 6, the psalmist expresses his confidence, his assurance. Then in the second section, he comes to petition, to prayer, out of the midst of the struggle and the conflict and the agony. And then he arrives again at his final conclusion with regard to this whole matter. Or if you like to put it in another way, we can put it like this. In the first section, verses 1 to 6, the psalmist is in heaven. In the second section, he is very much down to earth. And again, in the third section, he gives us his decision with regard to the whole of his future and as to how life is to be faced. Very well then, what we have here in this psalm is what we may well call a strategy for living. This is the psalmist's strategy for life and for living, for the battle, the conflict of life. And as you know, you must always start with strategy. You don't start with tactics, you start with strategy. And if you haven't got an overall strategy, you'll soon find yourself defeated. You may think you're getting a little victory here, but you've forgotten something else. So you must start with a grand strategy of life. And that's what we have stated to perfection in this one song. And this is the whole strategy. Always start in heaven and with God. Always. Then, having done that, come down to earth and face the problems of life and of earth and of living as you find them in the light of what you've already seen in heaven with God. Now here is the great principle. And we all get into trouble because we forget this principle, this essential strategy. Never start with your problems. Never. Never start with earth. Never start with men. Always start in heaven. Always start with God. And then in the light of that, come down 
and face your problems and your difficulties and your trials. That's really the one great message of the song. But he puts it, of course, in different ways. He puts it in this experimental form so that he's very much with us and one of ourselves. But this is the essential principle. And if we don't grasp this, there's no point in continuing. The one thing with which we must always start is our relationship to God. And the whole trouble in the world this morning is due to the fact that that's forgotten. They're all starting with men. They're starting with the world, with life, the problems. This is true of all who are not Christian, and that's why they never succeed. They've already started in a wrong way, and it must inevitably lead to failure. Very well, here is this great strategy, which we see in the mere division of the psalm into these three sections. Now then, having got this in our minds, let's follow the psalmist as he works this out for us. All I've got to do is just to... Uh, Show you what he does. I'm not preaching this. The psalm is preaching to you this morning. Listen to him and ask God to give you his spirit that you may understand this most precious truth which can revolutionize your whole life and your whole outlook upon life. Am I addressing someone who is defeated, who is frightened, fearful of life? My dear friend, here's the very thing you need. Listen for all your worth, for all your life. And this man will show you how to be more than conqueror. Very well. So we start with our first section. I'm using my own classification of his message. We start, therefore, with the psalmist's confidence. That's how he starts. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came up, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. And listen, though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. And on he goes in the fifth verse, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies, round and about me. So he ends by saying, I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Now this is tremendous confidence. He says, I'm not afraid, and there's no need to be afraid. No, mine enemies shall all gather and conspire together and come upon me all at the same time. It doesn't matter, let war rise against me. I'm not going to be afraid. Nothing can ever defeat me whatever it may chance to be. Now, this is overwhelming confidence and assurance. It's, of course, uh, typical of the uh, attitude of these men of God that we read of in the Bible uh, from the very beginning to the very end. If you want a kind of corresponding statement in the uh, New Testament, you think of the end of that great eighth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans, where having a given a list of his trials and troubles and tribulations, saying that we are led every day as sheep to the slaughter, he comes to this conclusion. I am persuaded, I am certain, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I know. I am certain. Now here is the great Christian note. Facing life at its very worst. There is no fear. There is no uncertainty. There is no shrinking or uh, trembling as it were. And fearful as you look at this unknown future. Not at all. Whatever it may be. I am confident. I am persuaded. I am certain. I am sure. Well, I, I must ask you again. You see, these things are not theoretical, and you and I are men and women living in the midst of life. Uh, have you got this confidence? Are you facing life like this? Are you able to face the future, whatever it may be, and say, I know, I am certain, I shall not fear, whatever may happen. In this, I am confident. Then uh, we must ask a question. What is the source of this man's confidence? Is this just foolhardiness? Is this just some kind of braggadocio? 
well, what is this man? Is he a man we can listen to? Well, we can, of course, because he's so honest, as I said just now. He's not merely making wild statements. We've known people like that, haven't we? We remember the Apostle Peter telling our Lord that though all men should desert him, he'd never desert him. And in a few hours he was denying him in base cowardice. No, no. It isn't that. Here, this man, let's follow him. Let's listen to him. On what does he base this confidence? What is the source of this great assurance of his? Well, he tells us quite plainly, it is nothing in himself. Not in himself at all. You see, that's the meaning of this extraordinary 13th verse, which reads in our translations, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, the words I had fainted are in italics because they're not in the original. They've been supplied, and rightly supplied, by the translator. You see, the psalmist is writing under the stress of a great emotion. He remembers this terrible predicament that he was in, the forces that were against him, and his consciousness of his own weakness. So he just blurts out saying, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord. And he just leaves it like that. Unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, I would have been completely undone. I would have been filled with despair. I would have fainted. Now, here, you see, is, is the starting point, and we must not forget this. This is not a mere boaster, a braggart. This is not just a foolish man who has confidence in himself and uh, who says that he doesn't care what life may bring against him, that he's so sure and certain of himself. He doesn't uh, write like the poet wrote at the end of the last century. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. It's not that sort of nonsense, for that is nothing but sheer nonsense. You see, a man who goes like that in self-confidence is a man who always fails. And there are many ways in which a man can fail. To become a cynic is failure. Just to resign yourself to life and its attendant circumstances is failure. And there are many like that. Great self-confidence, but they're real failures. They don't solve the problem. They don't get over the difficulties. They never know what it is to sing and to rejoice and to be filled with this spirit of exaltation. No, no, there's no true victory there. At their best, the self-confident people merely put up with things, keep a firm, stiff upper lip and brace back their shoulders and go on with some philosophy of courage. But that's not what we've got here. And the others, of course, they can't even do that. They just become complete failures, obviously defeated by the various temptations and trials of life. But you see, the thing about this man is this, that he's filled with this spirit of assurance and of rejoicing and he's praising. And it's due to the fact that his confidence is not in himself. And the first thing we all of us have got to learn in this world the first great characteristic of the Christian always is that he no longer is self-confident. He knows the truth about himself. He realizes also with the Apostle Paul that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high or heavenly places. He knows what he's up against, and he realizes his utter weakness and helplessness. I have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Very well, there's the first point, and it's a negative one, but it's an all-important one. If you feel that you are competent to stand up unto life and that you can deal with all these things that are set against you, you're the merest tyro, you're an ignoramus. You don't really understand the problems, and you don't understand yourself. No, no. This man's confidence isn't based upon himself. He makes it quite plain as to what the source of his confidence is. It is the Lord. 
Now this is always the distinguishing mark of the Christian. His confidence is entirely and altogether in the Lord. Now this man brings this out in a tremendous manner. Listen, the Lord is my light and my salvation. He starts with the Lord. How does he end? Wait, I say, on the Lord. He begins with him. He ends with him. And altogether in this psalm of 14 verses, he mentions the name of the Lord 13 times. Six times in the first section, four times in the second section, three times in the third section, the last section. But not only that, he starts the first section with him, the Lord is my light and my salvation. He ends the first section, I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Then he starts the second section with him, hear, O Lord, when I cry unto thee. And on and on he goes. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord. Wait on the Lord, here's his final exhortation to us. And he repeats it. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, here is the whole secret. It is the Lord. It isn't man himself. It isn't the believer. It is his confidence in the Lord. Now, what is this based on? What is the Lord to him? Well, he'll tell you. This is why he is so confident in the Lord. He says, the Lord is my light. What does he mean by that, you think? Well, I don't think that needs much imagination, does it? Light is the opposite to darkness. It's the opposite to despair. You remember how the gospel, in a sense, is introduced to us. The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. That's how the gospel always comes. What happens to us all as the result of these trials and troubles and tribulations in life is that we are in darkness. We don't understand. We say, why should these things be happening? Why should I be having to do as endure all this? I've tried to do this and that. I've tried to be godly and religious, but this is what is happening to me. And we are in trouble and we are in darkness. Not only that, we don't see what we can do about it. We seek for solutions. And this is the whole story of civilization. The world has been seeking for light, for solutions to the problems. It's the whole meaning of philosophy and all the effort of statesmen and government trying to find some light to illumine the darkness, to find a way out and a way of deliverance. But there is none. And so the whole world is in darkness. It's in darkness this morning. The people that sat in darkness, given up, the characteristic of our age is cynicism. You get it in your public entertainment, don't you? Sheer cynicism. What's the use of anything? distrust everybody. And people think it's funny and amusing. It's a terrible commentary on life. It's tragic. The world is full of cynics this morning. What's the use of anything, they say? And they don't believe in anybody or anything any longer. That's darkness. And that is men when left to himself. Obviously, the problems are so gigantic and immense he cannot begin to understand them. And he sits down finally in utter hopelessness and despair. It has nothing to be done. The people that sat in darkness. But the Lord is my light. Of course he is. It's the only light that is in the world this morning. Look at the light these children of Israel had. They had more light than anybody else. In spite of all their fumbling and all their disobedience, these men knew certain things that nobody else knew. That is why they stand out as the greatest people under the old dispensation. That is why their civilization was a purer one and a better one. Compare them with the life of paganism, as you can read it in the history of the Greeks and the Romans and all others. The Lord had given them light through the law that he'd given to Moses. And then you come to the New Testament. And suddenly everything changes. And one appears who can say, I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Light and understanding. The whole thing is explained to us. 
and a man who believes this revelation given by the Lord is a man who's not surprised that the world is as it is. You see, he doesn't believe in something foolish like evolution and believe the world's getting better and better because he sees it at the moment getting worse and worse. And he sees the futility of everything else, but he understands. He knows it's all due to men's rebellion against God. He doesn't expect any... De He's got light on the situation. He's no longer defeated. And then he sees another way, another kind of life, the way out. The Lord is my light. It doesn't matter what problem confronts the Christian. He's always got light on it in this book. It never fails. The Lord is my light and therefore my salvation, my deliverer. He's the one who guarantees my welfare. He's the one who shows me the way to escape. This is another way of putting, you see, that we can be made more than conquerors. The reserves, the power, and all the things that he gives. So the Lord is light and he is salvation, he is deliverance, he is an emancipator. You see, what he does is to deliver us from the thraldom of this world. We are translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. We belong to a different realm. Though we are still in this world, our citizenship is in heaven. And this is the thing that means salvation. There is a translation, a deliverance, a movement. We're taken out of it all. Not that we don't have to suffer, but we are taken out of it in understanding and in spirit and are put into this position of peace and rest and of safety. And then he goes on to say that the Lord is also the strength of his life. These are the three great characteristics that he mentions. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. And this, again, is a theme that runs right through the Bible. He's referring here, of course, to the power of the Lord. He sees the enemy. He's not a fool. He can assess the strength of the enemy. He knows the number of his battalions, his dispositions. He's well aware of all this. Though my enemy may rise, though war may rise against me. He's fully aware of all this and his own weakness, but he's got a power behind him. He's got a reserve. He's got one who understands and who is illimitable in all his resources and all his power. He rises and his enemies are scattered. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now, I'm only noticing these things we could spend the morning with every one of them. I'm most anxious that we should have this general composite picture this morning. But you know that hymn we sang just now, it puts it so perfectly, doesn't it? Here's the Christian's experience. A sovereign protector I have. Unseen, yet forever at hand. Unchangeably faithful to save. Almighty to rule and command. He smiles and my comforts abound. His grace, like the dew, shall descend, and walls of salvation surround the soul he delights to defend. He's my strength. Or as old Martin Luther put it, a safe stronghold our Lord is still, a trusty shield and weapon he'll help us clear from all the ill that hath us now overtaken. Now this, you see, is the source of this man's confidence. He knows that this is true about God. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is wisdom. God is knowledge. God is all these to perfection. And then his might and his power, the strength of his arm, the irresistible God. But you know, he knows other things about God which are more or less essential, lest we be frightened by the glory and the greatness of God. This man knows about God's concern for us. He says in the 8th verse, When thou saidst, Seek ye my face. My heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. But you notice what he says. When God said to him, Seek my face. Isn't this wonderful? This, you see, is God's concern for us. Though he is so great and high, and though he doesn't need us, we are his people, and he is concerned for us. And, you see, he invites us to come unto him. 
When we are in trouble, he in various ways uh, comes to us and says, Seek my face. Turn to me. Roll your burdens onto me. Seek my face. God comes to us even when we are overwhelmed by the troubles and we are beginning to turn to human expedience and we don't know what to do and we are utterly bewildered and frustrated. Uh, suddenly something says within us, why not turn to God? It's God himself who's doing it by the Spirit. He prompts us. Seek my face, says God. You see, you've forgotten me. And this is the great word of the whole Bible. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Or as we found Peter putting it in that uh, fifth chapter of his first epistle, he says, your adversary, the devil is roaming about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. How do you do this? Well, there's only one way to do it. He says, casting all your care upon God. Why should I do so? Well, the answer is, he careth for you. He knows all about you. He's interested. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Nothing can happen to you apart from him. And you see, there's one seated at the right hand of the Father who's been in this world and knows all about it. He careth for you. He's suffered all that we suffer, suffered the contradiction of sinners against himself, resisted unto blood, knows all about the travel and the agony and all the weakness of flesh. He knows it all because he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And so with his great care and concern, God says, seek ye my face. He encourages us. To come to him. He's not only there and ready and willing and waiting to help us. He even has to prompt us to turn to him in prayer. Well, again, you see, Tom Lady knew it so well from experience. You remember the second verse of which we've just been singing. Inspirer and hearer of prayer. God isn't merely the hearer of prayer. He's the inspirer of prayer. Seek ye my face. Inspire and hearer of prayer. Thou shepherd, shepherd and guardian of thine, I all to thy covenant care, both waking and sleeping, resign. Inspire of prayer, as well as the hearer of my prayer. This is the basis of this man's confidence. And then you see in the tenth verse, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Blessed phrase, take me up. We all fall, don't we? We struggle, we stagger, we stumble, we fall, and there we are lying on the ground, and we can't pick ourselves up. Nobody else can. But this everlasting and eternal God is ever ready to take us up, takes hold of us, lifts us onto our feet, establishes our goings. He's always ready to stoop to our weakness, mighty as he is. And then this other thing in that same verse, and here is our final confidence, his unchangeableness. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Thank God for fathers and mothers, but they're fallible, they're only human, they're sinful, and oftentimes they have forsaken. There are people here this morning who have been forsaken by father and mother simply because they've become Christians. The love of a father and a mother is a wonderful thing. But you know there are points at which it fails. This is one of the great tragedies of life. But it's true, isn't it? We're all changeable. We can't be relied upon in an ultimate sense. There is only one of whom that is true. And that is of God. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Listen to the poet. Can a woman's tender care cease? Toward the child she bear, yes, she may forgetful be. Yet will I remember thee. This is God speaking. Mine is an unchanging love. Higher than the heights above, deeper than the depths beneath. Free and faithful, strong as death. You see, there is a point beyond which human love can't go, even when it wants to. 
even though it doesn't turn its back upon us. There is a point beyond which it cannot go. There are certain secret problems. There are agonies of the soul where a father and a mother cannot help. God still can. And even in the agony of death, when all human aid has failed, God is still with us. Mine is an unchanging love. Higher than the heights above, deeper than the depths beneath, free and faithful, strong as death. Well, now, there is the basis and the source of this psalmist's confidence. He knows that these things are true of God, and while these things are true, he's afraid of nothing. He can challenge the whole universe, doesn't matter what rises against him, with such a God. That's the source of his confidence. Very well, my friends, I ask a question again. Have you got this? Do you face life like this? Are you more than conqueror? If not, you are anxious to ask a question, aren't you? And your question is this. How can I get this confidence? How can I attain unto the position of the psalmist? How can I not only get it, but maintain it and continue it? Now listen to this man. He's, he's anticipated you. He's written his psalm in order to help you. And here are his answers. The first great thing is believe in the Lord. I had fainted unless I had believed. It's always the beginning. You can't do anything without belief. The author of the epistle to the Hebrews says, He that cometh unto God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I have nothing to offer you this morning if you don't believe in God. I leave you to the utter despair and emptiness and horror of some of these clever journalists who vaunt their unbelief and their nothingness on the television. I leave you to the James Camerons and their final bankruptcy. There is nothing, nothing at all. But you must believe in God. Believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Accept the revelation. Humble yourself, become a little child, believe the truth. But even that's not enough. There are people here this morning who believe the truth about God as it's revealed here, and yet you're in trouble and you're defeated. Why? Well, because you haven't gone on to do the other things that this man tells us. Belief is the starting point, and only the starting point. You can be a Christian and get miserable and unhappy because you don't go on to the second point, which is this. The thing he emphasizes in verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Here's the thing. This one thing, this concentration. It isn't enough, you see. I've always believed in God. People have often told me this. I've always believed in God. I've always said my prayers. And yet they're full of troubles and problems and defeat. Why? Well, because a mere belief in God is of no value. The devils believe and tremble. Oh, you've got to concentrate. God has got to become the supreme thing in your life. God has got to be the one object of your desire and of your ambition. One thing that I desired. This total concentration upon God. Again, it's the theme of the whole of the scriptures. The Apostle Paul, at the height of his great experience, says this. This is his desire. This is the one thing he wants, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and so on. This one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind, I press toward the mark. One thing. It's the realization that nothing really matters ultimately in life except my relationship to God, that I may dwell in his dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now that doesn't just mean a physical building, material building such as this. It doesn't mean just that you want to spend the whole of your time in a temple or a tabernacle or a chapel or a church. That's only a part of it. What he really means is this, that I belong to the household of God. That I'm ever in communion with God, in fellowship with God, in touch with God. This is what he wants. He said, what I want above everything else in this world is always to be in that intimate relationship to God so that whatever happens, I'm with him and he's with me. This is the one thing he wants. This is the first thing in his life. And that's the secret of this man's whole position. What does he desire? Well, what does he do wrong? And here again, I want you to notice the order of these things. 
You know, this man's supreme desire is to worship God and to adore him. That's what he starts with. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. What for? To behold the beauty of the Lord. He's got it again in the 13th verse. I have fainted unless I have believed to see the goodness of the Lord. Now, this is a very interesting word that is translated here by behold. He wants to behold the beauty of the Lord. The much better translation would have been this. To gaze upon. To gaze upon. To meditate upon, to consider the beauty of the Lord. What does that mean? Well, to see the desirableness of God, to see his goodness, to consider and to meditate upon and to contemplate upon his excellences, the beauty of the Lord. This is what this man wants above everything else. He doesn't start with answers to prayers and deliverance or this and that particular blessing. No, no, he wants to know God and to gaze upon. This is adoration. This is worship. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the being of God. And he's also talking about God's dealings with us. The being of God. This man's supreme ambition was to gaze upon the glory of the being of God. Let the poet express it to us. My God, how wonderful thou art. Thy majesty, how bright. How beautiful thy mercy seat in depths of burning light. How dread are thine eternal years, O everlasting Lord, by prostrate spirits day and night incessantly adored. How beautiful, how beautiful the sight of thee must be. Thine endless wisdom, boundless power, and awful purity. Now this man wanted to gaze upon them. Glory of God. The beauty of the Lord in his very being. The consideration of his attributes. Do you do this? Is this your supreme ambition? Is this your greatest desire? My dear friend, this is the whole secret of life. If you want to be more than conqueror like this man, you must spend your time, this must be your supreme desire, in gazing upon the glory and the beauty of God. And then his dealings with us, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let another poet express this. This is Edison. When all thy mercies, oh my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view I'm lost in wonder, love, and praise. Do you know anything about that? Does your soul rise? As I'm mentioning these things this morning, is your soul rising within you? Do you know something of these transports of delight? But the question is, do you spend your time in gazing upon him? This man starts with worship, with adoration, You've got it in the New Testament. We all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. That's it. You set your affections on things above, not on things which are on the earth. He starts then with worship and adoration. And then he comes on to praise. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. You see, this, this is the secret of this man. You, you say your prayers, don't you? And when you're in trouble, you go to God and ask for this blessing or that. But my dear friend, you don't get it, do you? And you say, what's the point of praying? My prayers are not answered. Of course not. You don't know how to pray. You don't start with yourself and your petitions. You start with God. And you gaze upon his glory, the glory of his person, the glory of his works. And then you praise him. Praise the Lord. His glory shall saints within his courts below. Angels round his throne above all that see and share his love. Praise the Lord. His mercies trace, trace them. Praise his providence and grace. All that he for men hath done. All he sends us through his son. Do you praise God when you're on your knees alone? 
Do you just say your prayers mechanical or do you praise God? Do you trace his providence and grace? Do you count your blessings and name them one by one? And does your heart whirl up within you and outpour itself in praise and in thanksgiving? And it is only after all that that he then takes his petitions to him. Hear, O Lord, when I cry unto thee. Have mercy also upon me, and answer me. Hide not thy face far from me, but put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. Now, have you got the strategy of prayer again? That's the way to pray. Now, Paul has said it all in Philippians 4, 7 and 8. In nothing be anxious. Listen, but in all things, in all circumstances, listen, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Here it is. You start with adoration. Wonder of amazement. You look at him, you gaze upon him, and look at his glorious attributes, what he has been and what he's done for us and all the wonders of his way. You trace them out and then you praise him and then knowing him, you bring your petitions to him, whatever they may chance to be. And then he says, having done all that, wait for the answer. Wait for the answer. It hasn't finished the moment you've uttered your petition. Wait for the answer. Wait on the Lord. He's heard you. He's going to do it. He'll do it in his own way. Wait on the Lord. And then he comes to his inevitable and final conclusion. He says, you know, if I hadn't believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, if I didn't know that God is ready and waiting to bless his people in this world as well as in that which is to come, I would have fainted. Very well, he says to himself, first of all, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Start like that. Keep on like that. Make the central thing of your life the one big central thing. The gazing upon God. The getting to a knowledge of him that will be intimate and personal. A communion with him that will ravish your heart and cause your soul and heart to rise up within you. Seek his face. Go on seeking it. Wait upon him. Praise him. Put yourselves entirely and completely in his hands. And if you do so, you will find that he will be your light. Your salvation, your strength and power, your never failing refuge. No earthly father loves like thee, no mother, e'er so mild, bears and forbears as thou, as thou hast done with me, thy sinful child. Father of Jesus, Love's reward. What rapture will it be? Prostrate before thy throne to lie. And gaze. And gaze. On thee. How wonderful. The beatific vision. The end at which all the true People of God who wait upon him shall ultimately arrive. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.